Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Meeker O'Connell, and I serve as the Director of the Office of Clinical Policy here in the Commissioner's Office at FDA. So I'm going to be talking to you today about integrating quality into clinical trials, which is quite possibly one of my favorite things to talk and to think about. So in the clinical research enterprise, we often think of quality as an activity that exists separate from the design or the conduct of a clinical trial, perhaps as a separate function or department. In reality, quality is everyone's role that's involved in a trial, and quality is delivered through the decisions made and the actions taken along the way as a trial is in progress. And those of you who are serving as a clinical investigator have a really important role in delivering quality, as it is your work day in and day out, whether that's in engaging participants in carrying out protocol requirements or collecting trial data, those really form the bedrock of a trial that yields reliable data and reliable conclusions. So today, we're gonna talk about the regulatory perspective on clinical trial quality. We'll identify the federal regulations that govern clinical research um, and touch on a some key clinical investigator obligations. And we'll close with talking about some ways, um, some methods that you can use to enhance compliance with the federal regulations with study protocol requirements, and ultimately uh, deliver quality clinical trials. Oddly enough, you won't see the word quality defined in our IND regulations, although part of the reason FDA reviews protocols for IND studies prospectively is to assure that the quality of the scientific evaluation of drugs is adequate to permit an evaluation of the drug's safety and effectiveness. To understand quality in the context of how trials are conducted, we need to look to guidance. In this case, ICHE 8, Revision 1, which talks about general principles for clinical trials. So ICHE 8 defines quality as fitness for purpose. And what that means is if the trial is intended to support product approval, the trial design, its conduct, and the data that are generated, are fit for regulatory decision-making. This concept of quality as fitness for purpose extends from design into conduct in the latest revision of ICHE6, the Good Clinical Practice Guidelines. ICHE6 revision three, or R3, emphasizes proportionality and risk-based approaches, really looking at both quality in terms of keeping the emphasis and focus on the reliability of trial results and participants' safety. The intent here is to make sure we're minimizing unnecessary burden on participants, on sponsors and investigators through really keeping a keen focus on what matters most to quality. Um, and what matters most to participant safety, uh, with at the end of the day, a goal to yield efficient and reliable trials. In thinking about minimizing burden and focusing resources on what matters, a good example would be the draft E6R3 makes clear that there's no blanket study training requirement and that training should correspond to the role that an individual is expected uh, to take in the trial. At FDA, we refer to our regulations that govern human subject protection and the conduct of clinical trials as our good clinical practice regulations. Um, these govern the appropriate design, conduct, analysis, and reporting of trials. So if I had to distill the entirety of GCP uh, from our regulations, from, from the ICH guidelines down to three things, it would be that a trial is well-designed. 
That is, it's an appropriate scientific quality and the design itself is ethical. Second, that those conducting the trial adhere to ethical requirements for the protection of participants' rights, safety, and welfare, including obtaining institutional review board of review and approval and obtaining informed consent from participants. And lastly, that the trial generates reliable data that can be used to drive decision making, whether by a regulator, a clinician, or another party. So those three things to me, again, are good clinical practice. If you delve into our regulations and guidance, it's clear that multiple parties play important roles in trial quality. This includes sponsors who design trials, who oversee them, who analyze and report results. It includes contract research organizations to whom sponsors have transferred their responsibilities, as well as IRBs who provide initial and continuing ethical review and approval of research. And of course, those of you who are clinical investigators who translate a trial from the pages of a protocol into practice in the clinic are critical to quality. So under our regulations, who is an investigator? The clinical investigator on a trial is the individual who actually conducts a clinical investigation, that is, under whose immediate direction the drug is dispensed to a participant. If there's a team, the investigator is the responsible leader of that team. Clinical investigators are really at the center of it all um, and may engage with many different parties in the clinical trial environment. So if you're a clinical investigator, you serve as the key connection point between the participant and the trial. And to be able to start recruiting for a trial, you need to engage with the IRB for their approval and to communicate with them throughout the trial at various points. The sponsor has an obligation to select qualified investigators and to provide them with the information needed to conduct the study appropriately. And they also have an obligation to oversee trial conduct. So that means as an investigator, you'll engage with sponsor, and or CRO staff from initial study startup through close out of the trial at your site. FDA has a really important role to play in overseeing trials and verifying that data submitted to us are reliable and that participants are protected, which we do through both uh, reviews of protocols and also on-site inspections. If your trial is federally funded, the Office for Human Research Protections, uh, as a sister agency, may also be engaged in oversight of the human subject protection aspects uh, of your clinical trial. So again, it is a, a very broad range of people that it takes uh, to, to be able to, to carry out research. That may sound like a lot, and you may be sitting thinking to yourself, can I have a co-investigator? The answer is yes and no. Yes for your needs, but no for regulatory purposes. Each quote unquote co-investigator would be fully responsible for fulfilling all obligations of an investigator and would need to sign a separate form FDA 1572. Another question we frequently receive is whether the investigator has to be a physician, a medical doctor. The answer is no. The investigator needs to be qualified by training and experience as an appropriate expert to investigate the drug, but is not required to be a physician. A physician can be a sub-investigator if the clinical investigator is, is not medically trained um, so that there's somebody there to perform study functions that require the appropriate level of medical expertise. 
So I imagine that out there, there are some of, uh, of those in the, in the audience who may aspire to both design and initiate a trial, but also to conduct it. That is to play the role of both study sponsor and clinical investigator. Our regulations define this as a sponsor investigator, an individual who both initiates and conducts an investigation um, and under whose immediate direction the investigational drug is administered or dispensed. So in this case, you would need to know and adhere to regulatory requirements that apply to clinical investigators, which we'll walk through in the discussion today, as well as those that apply to sponsors. So sponsor investigators may also have regulatory obligations outside of those defined in FDA's regulations for clinical trial registration and results information submission to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank. This requirement is covered by 42 CFR Part 11. So this is a different Part 11 than FDA's, which is focused on electronic records and systems. This Part 11 is a final rule issued by NIH and HHS that implements the provisions of Section 402J of the Public Health Service Act as amended by Title VIII of the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007. So it, it clarifies and expands the, on the requirements for the submission of clinical trial registration and results information for certain applicable clinical trials. So this final rule was effective in January of 2017 when modifications to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank were implemented, allowing responsible parties uh, for certain applicable clinical trials to comply with the final rule. So I've mentioned a number of, of terms, responsible parties, applicable clinical trials. I'm not gonna go into detail on these requirements today, and that's because my colleagues at CEDAR have three excellent on-demand webinars that you can review at your leisure. These provide a wealth of information. They provide both a general overview of the clinicaltrials.gov data bank, um, walk through relevant definitions, laws, and regulations, um, and really provide an overview for what's needed to comply with the clinicaltrials.gov registration and results information submission requirements. Instead, I want to turn now and dive into the FDA requirements for clinical research and for clinical investigators in particular. FDA's legal framework starts with the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So Section 505I in the FDNC Act is the statutory authority for FDA's oversight of clinical investigations to test safety and effectiveness of drugs. So the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, includes regulations describing this authority over the conduct of clinical investigations. The FDA's portion of the CFR interprets the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act and related statutes. Section 21 of the CFR contains most of the regulations pertaining to, to food and drugs. Um, and the, the regulations that are issued under Section 505I describe FDA's authority over the conduct of clinical investigations. Guidance documents represent the agency's current thinking on a particular subject. Because guidances are not regulations or laws, they are advisory only and generally not enforceable. An alternative approach to what's described in guidance may be used if such approach satisfies the requirements of the applicable statute, regulations, or, or both. So this is the, the overall 
legal framework um, in which um, uh, clinical investigations are designed, conducted, overseen, uh, and reported. FDA expects clinical investigators um, that are operating in this framework to know the relevant regulations, to understand their responsibilities, and to adhere to the regulatory requirements. FDA's regulations are intended to ensure the integrity of clinical trial data on which product approvals are based, and they're intended to help protect the rights, safety, and welfare of those who participate in trials. Key for clinical investigators are requirements relating to providing financial disclosure, related to obtaining legally effective informed consent from participants, um, ensuring the initial and ongoing review of the study by an institutional review board, and lastly, understanding the investigator responsibilities laid out in parts 312 and 812 for drugs and devices, respectively. These investigator responsibilities are also laid out in the Statement of Investigator, our, our Form FDA 1572. Our regulations provide that no investigator may participate in an investigation until he or she provides the sponsor with a completed signed statement of investigator. If you look at the 1572, section nine outlines eight commitments that I would encourage you to read closely before signing. Don't treat this like a, 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 a EULA for an app. Each of these highlights key expectation of the agency. In signing the document, you're agreeing to adhere to the IRB approved protocol with limited exception. You're also agreeing to make sure potential participants are appropriately consented to the study in accordance with our human subject protection regulations at part 50. And in particular, that they're aware the drugs are being used for investigational purposes. And you're committing to maintain adequate, accurate records of the trial among other things. So these obligations all center on the clinical investigator. Under our regulations, the clinical investigator is in charge and held accountable for study conduct, including for activities that he or she may delegate to uh, members of study staff. So that really underpins the need to make sure staff and associates supporting trial conduct are aware of their obligations. Because while our regulations permit sponsors to formally transfer their responsibilities, for example, for study monitoring, to contract research organizations, clinical investigators cannot similarly transfer their responsibilities uh, to sub-investigators, site staff, study staff, or to CROs. Because the investigator's obligation to personally conduct or supervise a clinical investigator, a clinical investigation is so critical to trial quality, FDA put out guidance in 2009 with our recommendations on how clinical investigators can demonstrate this oversight and avoid challenges. For example, most clinical or medical tasks require formal medical training and may also have licensing or certification requirements. Licensing requirements may also vary by jurisdiction, uh, for example, by state or by country. Investigators need to take into account such qualifications or licensing requirements when considering delegation of specific tasks. In all cases, a qualified physician or dentist should be responsible for all trial-related medical decisions or care. Uh, during inspections of, in, of sites, there are cases where FDA has identified instances in which study tasks, like a physical exam or review of eligibility criteria, 
have been delegated to individuals lacking appropriate qualifications. Another area of focus in this guidance is supervision. So in thinking about whether to take on a trial, as a clinical investigator, you need to think about whether you have sufficient time to properly conduct and supervise the trial, taking into account the experience of your staff and their workload, the complexity of the trial design, and other ongoing trials that may compete for attention, among other factors. So I think this, this particular guidance can be uh, a useful resource for um, thinking about um, how to uh, put in, in effect uh, your responsibility for supervising the, the clinical trial. I know Leonard and John covered decentralized trials yesterday, but I think it's important to revisit here um, since we're focusing on the investigator role and expectations for oversight. So as you heard, FDA issued draft guidance earlier this year on DCTs. So trials with decentralized elements are important to expanding the tent of research. Bringing trial activities to where participants are, to me, is among the promising strategies for reducing barriers uh, to participation in clinical trials that can arise for participants who have to be at a specific facility for every trial visit. So that can be really limiting for those who have accessibility issues, those who don't live near a trial site, um, and for those whose family and job burdens preclude such on-site visits with the frequency required uh, by a trial protocol. DCTs may include the use of telemedicine to conduct remote trial visits, the use of informed consent um, in an electronic format, and direct distribution of investigational product to patients. All of those may uh, enhance trial convenience for participants, reduce burden on them or their caregivers, and potentially improve participant engagement. So I think um, Decentralized trials have, really have the potential to be very beneficial. When thinking about trial oversight, the responsibilities of a clinical investigator conducting a decentralized trial doesn't differ from their responsibilities if the trial were a traditional site-based one. That is, the investigator still needs to comply with the IND application regulations found in Part 312 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And in general, the investigator remains responsible for the overall conduct of a decentralized trial, including oversight of inv individuals that are delegated to perform trial-related activities. A key difference for decentralized trials is the extent to which different uh, decentralized elements are involved. So the extent to which the investigator is using telehealth, using trial personnel working remotely, uh, digital health technologies, or incorporating local healthcare providers into the conduct of the trial. So uh, just as a reminder, as defined in the draft decentralized trials guidance. Local healthcare providers are individuals who are carrying out trial related services that are part of their routine clinical practice, like taking vitals or conducting a physical exam. And uh, according to the draft guidance to, to be considered a local HCP, these services shouldn't require having a specific detailed knowledge of the protocol, the investigators brochure, or the investigational product. So when considering a decentralized trial and considering the extent of 
decentralized elements included, one of the things that the investigator should think through is his or her capacity to oversee participants' safety, depending on how many personnel are remote, whether there are local HCPs involved, um, and uh, the extent to which telehealth might be involved, for example. So based upon these differences and the decentralized features of the trial, including, including things like additional training coordination um, and or standard operating procedures might be necessary to ensure consistent implementation. To me, much of this comes down to what's been advocated in ICH E6, upfront risk assessment and management in thinking prospectively through challenges that might arise in implementing the trial. That is, thinking about what makes sense for this trial for this planned uh, patient population. For example, is there, uh, if there's a, a digital health technology involved, is there any specific training needed for trial personnel, participants, or for both personnel and participants? If uh, that a DHT is used, are they available and suitable for all participants? Uh, you might also think through if there are adverse events identified remotely, how will these be reported and managed? So again, to me, there's an, an aspect of, of uh, applying what we already know works and in, in really applying uh, risk-based approaches to implementation and oversight. For decentralized trials and for traditional site-based trials, investigators conducting drug trials have to complete Form 1572, the statement of the investigator. In addition to outlining the investigator responsibilities, that we've been discussing and will continue discussing, the 1572 includes information like the name and address of the clinical investigator, the names and addresses of research facilities where the trial will be conducted, uh, for example, medical schools or hospitals. Um, it includes the names and addresses of clinical laboratory facilities that are uh, to be used in the study and the names of any sub-investigators. So a question that often comes up about um, whether trial personnel should be included uh, as sub-investigators on the 1572, uh, that's just a question we often get. Um, so when trial personnel contribute directly and significantly to the trial data, they should be included as sub-investigators on the 1572. So if someone's assessing an endpoint, determining eligibility, or adjudicating adverse events, they would typically be making a direct and substantial contribution to the trial data. Local healthcare providers, as defined in the draft DCT guidance, should not be listed on form FDA 1572 as sub-investigators. Local HCPs should, however, be included in a task log, which the draft guidance discusses in more detail. Um, if you're looking for further recommendations just generally on completing a 1572, there is an information sheet um, and you can see at the bottom of the screen um, that provides guidance for sponsors, clinical investigators, and IRBs. So it walks through some frequently asked questions, and this was a, a, a guidance that we published in May of 2010. So just to touch quickly on device trials, similar to investigators and drug trials, investigators and device trials should also list local HCPs in a task log. Um, and separately, sponsors of device trials uh, must provide a list of all investigators as part of their IDE application. So let's come to our first challenge question and make sure, um, despite the fact that um, we are 
uh, at least um, on, on East Coast time, um, having this discussion shortly after what would be lunchtime. Let's make sure everyone is, is, is still with us with a, a challenge question. So per the draft decentralized trial guidance, where should local healthcare providers be listed? Should they be listed in the Form 1572 as a sub-investigator? Or B, should they be listed on the 1572 and in a delegation log? Perhaps it's C, um, local healthcare providers should be listed in the task log. Or is it D, the 1572 and the task log? I'll give you a moment to peruse, um, think about it, and hopefully um, everyone in the audience has come up with answer C, the task log. So this again, this task log is a, a concept described in the draft DCT guidance. Um, and that is uh, where we recommend that any local health care providers as defined in the draft guidance be listed. So let's turn to some key investigator responsibilities for safety reporting in clinical trials. In September of 2021, we issued a draft guidance on this very topic. So as an investigator, your responsibilities include monitoring for the occurrence of adverse events in study participants that you've enrolled in the trial and evaluating whether events are serious or not. Serious adverse events or SAEs need to be reported immediately to the sponsor. Non-serious adverse events should be recorded in trial records and reported to the sponsors according to the protocol requirements. As an investigator, you also have an obligation to review IND safety reports that the sponsor may send you. FDA generally considers that serious and unexpected adverse events that meet the criteria for an IND safety report, we generally consider those to be unanticipated problems involving risks to human subjects or others. Uh, and under our regulations, as an investigator, you know, must report such unanticipated problems to your IRB. These responsibilities don't function in a vacuum. For safety reporting to work as intended under our regulations, the sponsor, the IRB, and the investigator must each fulfill their responsibilities, and they need to frequently communicate with each other regarding the evolving safety profile of the investigational drug. This is a very, what you see on the screen is a, a, a very basic high level generalization showing how this continuous process should work for IND safety reporting. So let's walk through it. So the sponsor must evaluate SAEs and submit IND safety reports to the FDA and to all participating investigators. The sponsor must also evaluate safety signals in the aggregate. Where appropriate, the sponsor needs to modify the investigator brochure, the protocol, and or the informed consent based on the evolving safety signals of the investigational product. For the sponsor to be able to comply with these requirements, the investigator has to identify adverse events, determine if they're serious, and report them to the sponsor. Further, the investigator has a continuing duty to protect the safety of, of trial participants. To appropriately do so, they need to review the IND safety reports that the sponsor sends to them. In turn, the investigator must report unanticipated problems, including those that arise from IND safety reports to the IRB. Where necessary, the investigator may need to modify the informed consent form 
and submit it to the IRB for review and approval. The IRB must then comply with its obligation to continuously review the research by reviewing unanticipated problem reports from the investigator. The IRB must follow its written procedures to ensure the safety and well-being of participants. So I want to quickly move us to a second challenge question. So drumroll please, who has responsibility for reporting unanticipated problems involving risks to human subjects or others to the IRB? Is it A, the sponsor, B, the investigator, C, the contract research organization that's supporting the sponsor, or D, all of the above? Well, we did talk about everyone playing a role in safety reporting. I hope you'll recall that it is B, the investigator who has the responsibility for um, identifying and reporting unanticipated problems involving risk to human subjects or others to the IRB. We just mentioned that new safety information can lead to changes in the informed consent document. So let's go back to the beginning of the study and talk a little bit about the requirements for informed consent in our regulations. First, under 312.60, unless certain exceptions are met, such as the um, exemption from informed consent requirements for emergency research at uh, Part 5024, the investigator must obtain the informed consent of each participant to whom the drug is administered. Informed consent needs to meet the requirements for required content that's outlined in 21 CFR Part 50.25. There are eight basic elements of informed consent um, that uh, I'll walk through briefly. There are also um, other elements um, that um, might be necessary depending on the particular study. But the basic elements are that the study involves research, an explanation of the purpose of the research and the expected of, uh, duration of the participation of a, a trial subject, a description of the procedures to be followed, and identification of procedures which are experimental. Second, there needs to be a description of any reasonably foreseeable risks or discomforts to the subject. Um, there also needs to be a description of any benefits to the subject or to others which may reasonably be expected from the research. There also needs to be disclosure of appropriate alternative procedures or courses of treatment, if any, that might be advantageous to the subject, um, as well as a statement describing the extent, if any, to which confidentiality of the records identifying the subject will be maintained. And this statement needs to note the possibility that the Food and Drug Administration may in inspect the records. For research involving more than minimal risk, the consent should include an explanation as to whether any compensation um, uh, and an explanation of whether any medical treatments are available if injury occurs, and if so, what they consist of, uh, or where further information may be obtained about it. There needs to be an explanation of whom to contact for answers to pertinent questions about the research and research subjects' rights, and whom to contact in the event of a research-related injury to the participant. And last, the uh, uh, mandatory elements include a statement that participation is voluntary, that refusal to participate will involve no penalty or loss of benefits to which the participant is otherwise entitled, and that the participant may discontinue participation at any time 
without penalty or loss of benefits to which they're otherwise entitled. So those are the required elements. Um, you know, one thing that I would emphasize is that those required elements um, should be kind of described in a um, participant uh, friendly language that, that they're able to understand. Um, I think sometimes we see consent forms that are quite voluminous um, that um, may be impenetrable um, to those considering uh, participating in a trial. So, you know, keep that in, in mind as well. Um, there's information that needs to be conveyed, um, but it can be conveyed in a manner um, that um, helps the subject, the potential participant, understand whether a particular trial um, is uh, a good option for them. And so we've been talking about the document, but the informed consent process needs to also provide an opportunity for study participants to ask questions and receive answers. And process is a really important word. Informed consent is just not the document or a signature on a document. It's an ongoing process that must occur before any study related procedures or tests are conducted um, and includes uh, the process extends into uh, trial conduct and making sure that participants are made aware of any new information that might um, change their decision to continue participating in a particular trial. When thinking about obtaining informed consent, we often get the question of whether the investigator has to sign the informed consent document. So the answer is no. If you're thinking about uh, the, a, a requirement that the person conducting the informed consent discussion must sign and date the document, you'll find that in the ICH E6 guideline, but not in FDA's regulations. So if you have questions about consent, we published a final guidance on informed consent, um, providing guidance for IRBs, for clinical investigators and sponsors. So this is relatively hot off the press. It published um, just a few months ago in August. It has a wealth of information about the informed consent document, the informed consent process, and other ethical considerations. It's organized to provide, uh, in the first part, general guidance on FDA's regulatory requirements for informed consent. And that's followed by a discussion of the roles of various parties for consent. And finally, it includes a series of frequently asked questions about informed consent. So if you have a question, it might possibly be answered uh, or hopefully be answered in this guidance. Um, if it's not, um, I would encourage you to send your questions to um, our uh, GCP mailbox at gcpquestions at fda.hhs.gov. We published a guidance in 2016 that's specific to the use of electronic informed consent. So this was a joint guidance that we issued with the Office of Human Research Protections, the, the office that um, governs human research protections for uh, federally funded and supported research. So this particular guidance provides recommendations on the use of various electronic media to obtain and to document informed consent. And by aligning with advances in technology, we think that 
electronic informed consent may provide some advantages. It may improve participants' comprehension, and it may also increase their engagement. It allows the opportunity for study participants to be able to review informed consent forms and to sign them from the comfort of their own home or wherever is most convenient for them. So from the patient perspective, this might translate into convenience. They don't have to travel to a research site um, for the purpose of informed consent. They can review the consent form and consult with their family members without um, having the uh, pressure of, of time or the constraints of a, a particular on-site visit. Participants who have the opportunity to review the consent form at their leisure um, may also uh, you know, have time to make arguably a more informed decision. And you know, this, in, this could include not just electronic in, informed consent, but supplementing consent forms with electronic technologies that can really help participants better understand the research. And these technologies um, may be capable of engaging potential participants more than a traditional paper consent form might. So for the last part of my time with you, I want to turn to some proactive practices, prevention always being better than remediation when it comes to trial quality. If you're a clinical investigator conducting a trial for a sponsor, there are approaches that sites have taken to kind of avoid uh, being non-compliant with the protocol. The first is to appraise the study beyond just assessing whether it's of scientific interest to you, but really looking at how the study as written might translate to operations at your site. What are the anticipated visits? What's the participant flow through these visits? And is there a difference from the standard clinic workflow for similar encounters? Are there telephone visits that wouldn't normally occur that need to be accounted for in your workflow? Second, you could consider what data activities are really critical to conduct and collect, and are these part of the normal clinical encounter are, again, something to plan for. Um, you might consider whether there'll be specialized expertise needed, for example, a radiologist for certain scans or any special equipment needed for the study. I, I really think the sites that have used this successfully are really looking for those as well as other study specific nuances that may differ from other trials, um, like adverse events of special interest that aren't SAEs but need to be reported differently than other adverse events, for example, on a special form or on a different timeline. Some sites may do dry runs or beta tests to double check whether there's clarity on roles and responsibilities whether there's sufficient staffing for visits that are particularly activity laden and to make sure that they have clarity on how and where source data will be recorded. Once the study is up and running, um, I think there's also opportunity to look at a records from study visits in near real time to help identify any gaps or departures early so that um, actions can be implemented to prevent them from recurring and, and becoming persistent. For those sponsor investigators in the crowd who are designing trials, a very important proactive practice is described in ICH uh, E8 Revision 1, and that's the concept of clinical quality by design of focusing on the critical aspects of the trial, the things that must go right to yield credible conclusions and reliable data and to protect trial participants. Quality by design means focusing on these critical aspects at the time of design. Um, and this is a concept that is carried through 
into trial execution um, and ICH E6 R3. So why at the time of design? Well, we know that clinical trials are a real fundamental part of, of, of research. Their results are essential for evidence-based healthcare decisions. And if we don't address design issues, we risk yielding unreliable and or inadequate evidence. Uh, a poorly designed trial, in addition to a poorly conducted one, wastes resources and may not align uh, with ethical principles. So when you're designing a trial, you have an opportunity to avoid these challenges. Design is the point when you can identify critical aspects of trial design and take steps by tailoring design to avoid the kinds of errors that impact regulatory decision making. That is, those that undermine participant safety or those errors that um, challenge data reliability. Protocol design and development is also an opportunity to ask, why have we included this, whether it be data collected or a procedure conducted? It's an opportunity to ask that question and then to streamline the trial where feasible. It's also a last checkpoint to verify that the trial that you've designed uh, will answer that important scientific question you had in mind uh, when starting out. And finally, the outcomes of a protocol design stage review can translate to efficient focused implementation and oversight. The risk-based quality management and monitoring that's in FDA's guidance uh, in ICH E6 R3 and in guidance uh, from other regulatory authorities. Let's walk through an example of how this could help both sponsor and investigator to proactively assess a protocol before starting a study. Again, this, this case is thanks to my CEDAR Office of Scientific Investigation colleagues. It relates to a marketing submission that included a randomized, uh, a very large randomized cardiovascular outcome study powered based on the predicted number of primary endpoints. The primary endpoint was MACE, so major adverse, uh, adverse cardiovascular events, and there was an independent adjudication committee for MACE events. During application review, FDA identified sites for inspections, including a site, we'll call it site A, that had high enrollment and data trends suggesting potential underreporting of events, both safety events and for the primary endpoint. On inspection, the site records showed events that appeared consistent with a MACE event, the primary endpoint. These events had been sent to the adjudication committee, but had been adjudicated negatively. The challenge, according to the PI in, in discussions during the inspection, was that when events occurred outside of the site and its network, they had extreme difficulty obtaining any records that were needed by and requested by the adjudication committee due to a reported litigious climate. So in the absence of records to confirm these events, the impact was that the predicted number of, of primary endpoint events was not reached. The study was underpowered and the sponsor had to at substantially increased cost and with an increased uh, trial length, they had to implement a protocol amendment with a re-estimated sample size. So as I think about this, the sponsor might have considered global differences in site practices that might have revealed this as a risk requiring some mitigation. For example, by considering how and where the endpoint might occur, be documented, and how the documents needed by the adjudication committee would be obtained. The site in a dry run or walk through the processes might have identified the need to obtain documents from external institutions as a potential challenge. So um, now we've come to the end of our somewhat whirlwind tour. Um, so I'll summarize by highlighting the value 
and the role of clinical investigators in delivering trial quality. And for those sponsor investigators taking on the dual role of clinical investigator and sponsor, you also have the additional obligation of transparent reporting of results of uh, applicable clinical trials to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank. Whether you are an investigator or a sponsor investigator, you have an obligation to make sure that staff supporting trial conduct have a clear understanding of the protocol and their responsibilities under FDA regulations. At stake at the end of the day is public confidence. We all suffer if the public loses confidence in trial integrity. Conversely, trials that are designed well, conducted well, and that respect participants and that are reported transparently build public confidence and encourage broad participation, which ultimately yields safe and effective products. So I think um, I, you know, we have time uh, for questions uh, later this afternoon. Um, happy to address them. And again, just a reminder, uh, you'll see the email at the bottom of the screen. Um, that is our um, Within my office, we uh, maintain an inbox for GCP questions, and that is gcpquestions at fda.hhs.gov. I probably should have made that a, cha a challenge question because I, I hope it's something you remember as, as a resource. If you're looking for things and guidance, can't find it, have questions that aren't addressed in guidance, um, it's a very valuable resource. But with that, I will close and look forward to uh, answering your questions later. Thanks so much. Thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be talking with you all about clinical investigator site inspections and what to expect. This presentation will build upon the talk before me on investigator responsibilities. So kudos to the organizers for making such a thoughtful schedule. Now that you know your regulatory responsibilities as clinical investigators, we are now going to look at them from an inspections perspective. We will discuss the purpose and focus of clinical investigator inspections describe the inspection timeline and activities, and lastly discuss potential enforcement actions if significant regulatory violations are identified through the inspections. In terms of regulatory responsibilities as CIs, this list is not inclusive, but probably includes those most relevant to inspections. As CIs, you are responsible for ensuring that the investigation is conducted according to the investigational plan, the protocol, and applicable regulations. You are responsible for protecting the rights, safety, and welfare of human subjects participating in your trials. You are responsible for obtaining informed consent and IRB approval or oversight and for maintaining adequate control of drugs or any other FDA-regulated investigational product under investigation. Clinical investigator inspections fall under the umbrella of good clinical practice inspections. Good clinical practice, or GCP, is an international ethical and scientific quality standard for the design, conduct, monitoring, auditing, recording, analysis and reporting of clinical trials. So these inspections evaluate clinical trials for compliance with GCP and regulations, so as to ensure the rights, safety, and welfare of human subjects, as well as ensure the reliability of the safety and efficacy data submitted to FDA in marketing applications. Other inspected clinical trial entities include sponsors, contract research organizations, and institutional review boards. 
Clinical investigator inspections will look at how the trial was conducted at your site. And so the first question the inspection will attempt to answer is, was the study conducted according to the protocol? The items on this list are just some of the areas we will be looking at with respect to protocol compliance. For example, did subjects fulfill all inclusion criteria and none of the exclusion criteria? Were randomization and blinding procedures followed? Did anyone become unblinded? What was the data flow from your site to the sponsor's database? Were the pre-specified study visits, procedures, and evaluations performed as written in the protocol? And were subjects dosed correctly? Another question we are trying to answer with the inspection related to trial conduct is, did the study conduct comply with regulations? Again, this list is not inclusive but areas we will look at include adverse event reporting, IRB oversight, consent procedures, financial disclosures being submitted, electronic records being managed, and study drug accountability. Another important component of clinical investigator inspections is source data verification where the data generated by your site is compared to the data that was submitted to FDA. Now, as you all know, the amount of data generated by a site in a given trial can be a lot. So we tend to focus on high yield data such as primary endpoint data, whether adverse events or protocol deviations were unreported, and laboratory data. However, the specific data we will validate at your site will be tailored based on the FDA review team's interests. There are two types of clinical investigator inspections. The first type is routine surveillance inspections, and these coincide with a pre-marketing application review in that the sponsor has submitted an application to market a product, and clinical trials were used to support that application which now need to be inspected. These inspections are generally pre-announced. We let you know that we are coming. The other type of inspection is for cause or directed inspection, where we investigate potential regulatory violations. These stem from a complaint that we have received. Sponsors, IRB, study staff, study participants, virtually anyone can submit a complaint to FDA. These four cause or directed inspections are generally unannounced. They are unannounced because if FDA is going to inspect you for a potential regulatory violation, we don't want to give you time to fix it before we get there. For logistical reasons, foreign inspections are generally announced. First challenge question, which is not a regulatory responsibility of clinical investigators? A, obtaining informed consent. B, obtaining IRB review or approval. C, paying subjects for trial participation. Or D, ensuring that the investigation is conducted according to the investigational protocol. So take a few seconds to consider which answer you think is correct. And hopefully you thought it was C, paying subjects for trial participation. All the other options are your regulatory responsibilities. Probably the section you've most been anticipating, what exactly happens during an inspection? Before the inspection, there is the pre-announcement. Again, if this is a routine surveillance inspection, you will be contacted up to five days before the start of the inspection. There will be some discussion of inspection scope and logistics, such as the protocols being covered and the records we plan to look at just in case you need to retrieve them or gain computer access. 
how long we anticipate being there, again, anticipate, based on the number of subjects and protocols the inspection will cover and the workspace. On the very first day will be the opening meeting. The FDA team usually consists of one or more investigators from the Office of Regulatory Affairs. Their other title is known as Consumer Safety Officer. On occasion, a subject matter expert from the center having jurisdiction over the product being researched may also be in attendance. Regardless, whoever is representing FDA will provide their credentials and a notice of inspection to you. At this opening meeting, we will discuss the basis and scope of the inspection, such as the number of studies, subjects, and data to be verified, your availability, and the staff's availability for meetings or questions as they come up throughout the course of the inspection, and as part of the inspection process, we may collect exhibits, so we may ask you to provide specific documents electronically for us to take, and so we will discuss with you how you will provide those documents to us, usually through scanning. There will also be an interview just to ascertain your knowledge of the study or studies being inspected. Questions could include how you were selected by the sponsor, asking you to provide an overview of the study at the site, describing how subjects were recruited, whether any significant issues were experienced, such as protocol deviations or serious adverse events, and how these were handled, and a list of studies conducted by yourself. This gives us an idea of your workload, um, not just clinically, but as a researcher. We may also do a facility tour of the various areas at the study site, such as how you stored the investigational medical product. However, the bulk of the inspection will be spent reviewing records, so tidy, well-organized, and comprehensive record keeping is key. In terms of study records, we will look at protocols, correspondence from the IRB or the sponsor, monitoring reports, signed investigator statements and financial disclosure forms from you and your sub-investigators, training logs, how you delegated tasks to your staff, laboratory certifications, and medical product accountability records to your site, such as shipping and receipt records. In terms of subject-specific records, we will look at informed consent forms, visit worksheets, laboratory reports, progress notes, adverse event reports, efficacy endpoint assessments, and medical product accountability records on a subject level, such as dosing and administration. Generally documents that show subject participation at your site. On the last day of our inspection, there will be an inspection closeout meeting where we will provide a summary of inspection findings and discuss any issues of concern. If any of the issues raise concern for possible deviations from federal regulations, a Form 483 will be issued. Note the word possible, as back at FDA, after we have reviewed everything, we will determine whether each observation constitutes a regulatory violation, and if so, determines the impact on data integrity and subject. If issues or observations are discussed at your closeout meeting, you are welcome to provide a verbal response at the meeting, or you may provide a written response. This written response is optional, but it should be received by FDA within 15 business days of inspection close. Although it is optional, a written response uh, may be helpful in that it demonstrates to FDA your acknowledgement and understanding of the observations. It demonstrates your commitment to correct the observation to FDA. And probably most importantly, it may be considered in the F final FDA compliance decision. If you do wish to provide a response, it should contain the following, a corrective, 
and preventive action plan for each observation, a timeline for completion of actions, a method for verifying and monitoring the effectiveness of the actions, and submitting documentation, such as training records or standard operating procedures that you have created. The final FDA classification will occur after formal review of the inspection report, 483, and the written response if provided. The basis for the final FDA classification is whether objectionable conditions were observed. Objectionable conditions are those where subjects were exposed to unreasonable and significant risk of injury, subjects' rights, safety, and welfare were compromised, or data integrity and reliability were compromised. With those criteria for objectionable conditions in mind, let's move on to the types of FDA classifications for CI inspections. The first is no action indicated or NAI. No objectionable conditions or practices or the significance of the documented objectionable conditions found does not justify further action. For this, you will receive a letter. Regarding the timing of the letter, the letter may be released to coincide with other inspection letters or the application review, so it may take a while for you to receive the letter after the inspection, but it will eventually come, don't worry. The next classification is Voluntary Action Indicated, or VAI. Objectionable conditions were found and documented, but the center is not prepared to take or recommend regulatory action since the objectionable conditions do not meet the threshold for regulatory action. For this, you will also receive a letter, but it will just describe those objectionable conditions. The final FDA classification is official action indicated. Objectionable conditions were found and regulatory action is recommended. Before we move on to the actual outcomes of an OAI, let's look at some common inspection findings that might be included in the Form 483 or inspection letter. So here's a list of, of regulatory violations and the corresponding regulation. So first, the investigation may not have been conducted in accordance with the investigational plan or the signed investigator statement failure to prepare or maintain accurate case histories, so poor record keeping, failure to obtain informed consent in accordance with 21 CFR Part 50. Investigational drug disposition records were not adequate, and failure to report promptly to the IRB all unanticipated problems involving risks to subjects and failure to report adverse events promptly to the sponsor. So back to OAI, some outcomes could include a letter describing those objectionable conditions or disqualification, wherein the investigator is not able to conduct clinical investigations involving products regulated by FDA. Other enforcement actions could include civil money penalties or debarment. Debarment usually follows after a federal felony conviction, and in that situation, the individual may not provide services in any capacity to a drug company. Okay, challenge question number two. Which of the following statements is not true? A, a written response to a 483 is required. B, a written response to a 483 is due within 15 business days of inspection close. C, outcomes of an OAI classification could include disqualification or a letter. Or D, a written response may be considered in the final FDA compliance decision. So take a few seconds to consider which answer you think is correct.
and hopefully you thought it was A. A written response to A483 is required. It is not required. It is optional. But if you do choose to do so, it is due within 15 business days of inspection close, and it's possible that it may be considered in the final FDA compliance decision. If you want more information about what exactly goes on in a clinical investigator inspection, you can check out this compliance manual, which lays out all the items to be covered in an inspection. So building on your knowledge of your regulatory responsibilities as CIs, in this talk, we have discussed the purpose and focus of CI inspections and what exactly goes on during an inspection. And so hopefully now that you know what to expect, you can be prepared if an inspection occurs. The best way to survive an inspection is to always be prepared for one. That concludes my presentation. I will be back shortly to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining this session. My name is uh, Kasa Yalu. I'm the director of the Division of Clinical Compliance Evaluation in the Office of Scientific Investigations within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. My presentation is intended to provide you information and insight on international clinical trials from GCP perspective. Disclaimer, the views expressed in this presentation are those of mine. They do not necessarily represent those of the Food and Drug Administration. My presentation has two objectives, and uh, first and foremost, it, it is intended to provide you information and a general overview of international clinical trials from a GCP perspective. Uh, secondly, it's also to provide you information on how to comply with uh, FDA's regulatory requirements when you are engaged in uh, conducting clinical trials uh, internationally. As it is well known, clinical trials are increasingly global. As a result, data regulators such as FDA use to authorize drug products often are generated from trials that are conducted across the globe. Clinical trials in support. As a result, data regulators such as FDA use to authorize drug products often uh, you'd be required to ensure IRB review, approval, and the reporting requirements are made. And in addition, as investigators for IND studies, so you'd be required to ensure FDA has access to inspect your records and uh, reports as uh, applicable or appropriate. And um, IND studies investigators will be also required to ensure the informed consent is adequately obtained. And last, but not least, and investigators are specific procedures and uh, they may also review the informed consent and uh, the IRB oversight process uh, as well as documentation to determine the ethical development of um, the product at the specific site. If the inspectors may also compare uh, line listings generated from a sponsor submission with the source documents to verify the reliability of data uh, submitted uh, to regulators. And FDA inspectors uh, may review um, the study uh, participant enrollment process, and uh, they may also review uh, the monitoring activities at a particular site. Uh, inspectors may also review uh, clinical investigators' compliance with applicable uh, regulatory expectation when it comes to reporting, such as uh, safety reporting, uh, financial uh, disclosure reporting. And uh, they also may uh, look into uh, test article control at the site, and uh, they may review uh, records custody and retention. Sponsor and CRO inspection focus. Sponsor and CRO inspection generally focus on key areas such as reviewing protocol compliance, data integrity, regulatory adherence, and overall quality of the clinical trial conduct. The inspection includes reviewing organizational structure, registration of trials according to a regulatory requirement, assessing the investigator's election process, and uh, evaluation of the adequacy of communication with clinical investigators. The inspection also review the adequacy of monitoring process, the quality audit procedures, and adverse event reporting. The other areas of focus include assessing data handling and the control of investigational product by the sponsor and CRO. 
the inspection of uh, CRO and uh, sponsors, also review computerized processes, electronic records and signatures, and adequacy of record keeping, as well as record retention. It also reviewed the adequacy of financial disclosure reporting. Like during the inspection of chemical investigators, the inspection of sponsor and CRO review if clinical trial is conducted in accordance with good clinical practice. Before we conclude uh, this presentation, I would like to share the card from FDA's principal, Deputy Commissioner Janet Utkoka's take home point. Wherever clinical trials are conducted, it is important to have drug development programs that reliably produce high quality data acquired in a manner that will not jeopardize the rights, safety, or welfare of trial participants. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone, and we're moving into our final question and answer period of the day. Uh, thank you so much to the three speakers. I uh, think, you know, as indicated in the number of questions that we're getting, uh, you cover very practical information that's relevant to the clinical investigator and in the day-to-day -day role of the clinical investigator, very, very important role in the clinical trial space. Uh, I, I'd like to start the Q&A session. Um, Stephanie, uh, you're hopefully still on the line. Um, so question for you. How long do I have to keep records for? Hi, thank you for that question. Um, so FDA regulations uh, require that you keep records uh, for two years after the date a marketing application has been approved for the indication it's being investigated. However, you can retain records for a longer period based on you know, the, the sponsor's procedures, the protocol, or your own site's uh, standard operating procedures. Great, thank you so much. And then uh, a related question, is it acceptable to retain paper records as electronic records and destroy the original paper records to minimize storage requirements? Hi, thank you for that question. Um, yes, it's acceptable, you know, to help with storage that to convert paper documents into an electronic record, um, just provided that the electronic record um, is a certified copy of the original information, uh, meaning that this, this certified copy or electronic record has been verified to have the same information as the original, um, either through a dated signature or some sort of validated process to make sure that it's the same. Um, it's, it's great if you have uh, written standard operating procedures, you know, that describe how you're going to make these copies, how you verify that they are, are like the original and, and, document, and document that. Great, thank you so much. And, and clearly record keeping is very central uh, of importance to investigators. We have another question on that. Uh, if the inspection identifies issues with record keeping or protocol compliance that were caused by research staff or sub investigators, who is responsible? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, as Anne actually talked about, um, as clinical investigators, um, you, you all have ultimate responsibility uh, for study conduct at your site. So um, if there are certain uh, if there's if you've delegated certain tasks to other individuals, and uh, you know that there have been issues related to their uh, conduct, um, you are responsible for them, and so that's why um, the inspection is tied to the clinical investigator. Great, thank you so much, um, Anne. Uh, several questions for you related to the fifteen seventy two forms. Uh, so one, uh, does each sub-investigator need to sign a separate 1572? Thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the 1572 is actually signed by the clinical investigator. So some might uh, call that the principal investigator. So the, the sub-investigators 
don't individually need to sign a 1572, their names are actually listed on the 1572, but they don't need to complete one. Thank you. And then I think a slightly different but related question, do we need to resubmit the form 1572 if a sub investigator is added or retired during, during a clinical trial? Or do we only need to resubmit form 1572 when there is a change in the principal investigator? That is another great question. Um, and one that I think, um, you know, I think it has been an area reasons when a 1572 needs to be completed. Um, and those are when there is a new clinical investigator or when the clinical investigator at a particular site is replaced. So you don't need to complete an updated 1572 uh, if there are um, changes to sub-investigators. Um, those can be documented in study records and communicated to the um, sponsor, um, and they can update the, the IND as appropriate. Thank you. And one more while we're on the subject of 1572s. You mentioned the Form 1572. What do I do if I'm an investigator outside the United States in a country where I am not allowed to sign such a document? Thank you. Another, another common question and one where we actually have a, a full guidance on the topic. So uh, that uh, on 1572s that includes this topic, I should say. Um, so if a clinical study is conducted at a foreign site under an IND, all FDA IND regulations, including the requirement to obtain a signed 1572 have to be met unless the sponsor requests and is granted a waiver that provides for specific exceptions. So in the case where uh, a, a clinical investigator in a foreign country can't or, or won't sign the, the 1572, for example, because regional, national, or local laws or regulations prohibit signing it, the sponsor may submit a request for a waiver of the 1572 signature requirement, and that's under our regulations at 312.10. Um, so waiver of the signature on the form 1572 when granted enables the study at foreign sites to be and or remain under an IND, even though the investigator at those uh, sites can't sign the form. And that's provided that the sponsor complies with the terms of the waiver. So thank you. Thank you for that. And, and while we're on the subject uh, of non-US sites, CASA, we have a few questions for you. Um, is FDA's approach to inspecting non-US sites uh, or clinical trials different from its approach to inspecting sites or clinical trials in the United States? Um, uh, th thank you for the question. I, I think that's a great question. And uh, can you hear me? Just want to make sure. And yeah, um, yeah. and uh, the inspection approach is the same, respective of uh, the location where uh, clinical studies uh, may be conducted. The approach of the inspection would be the same. And um, and also the, uh, the selection of uh, sites for inspection uh, would take uh, the several factors. Uh, that are relevant to both U.S. and the U.S. sites or uh, clinical studies that are conducted in the U.S. and outside U.S. And we take a risk-based approach to identify uh, clinical investigator sites uh, for inspection. And uh, that uh, takes into account the application label factors, uh, whether the application is uh, for new molecular entity or uh, um, if the study uh, um, in support of the marketing application. It's a very complex study or the study that we would like uh, to, to, to inspect and to understand better uh, the conduct of the study. And uh, also, of course, uh, the site level factors and uh, taking into account the comparative performance of uh, uh, the site, the site level information, whether it's efficacy or safety, and also the compliance history of the sites. And uh, the bottom line, uh, our inspection approach uh, for U.S. and then U.S. sites um, 
uh, uh, are the same. Thank you. Terrific. And I think your answer actually covered the next question on the list as well, uh, which is what are the selection criteria for foreign sites uh, inspections or clinical trials? Um, so if you have more to add, please do there. Uh, otherwise, the, the next question for you is, uh, is there a difference between U.S. and non-U.S. based investigators in terms of the types of deficiencies noted during inspections? Great. Yeah, thank you. I'll try to address both. And um, as you said, I touched upon some of uh, the things that were um, asked. And uh, we, in general, I mean, taking into account uh, the resource issue, uh, also the, um, the breadth of um, the, the clinical investigator sites across the globe, uh, we, we, we have uh, several things that to take into account before sending someone to inspect sites outside the US. And um, uh, we, in general, tend to send uh, international inspections uh, when um, the internationals, um, when there are insufficient domestic data uh, to, to provide us uh, confidence on uh, reliability of uh, the information, as well as uh, uh, making sure that the, the study subject is, um, were protected during the clinical study. Also, we take into account, I mean, rarely um, close to 10% uh, of um, uh, the data sometimes comes solely from foreign countries, and those instances uh, make us to go uh, to do an inspection outside US. And if you do see uh, conflicting data between the US, uh, the data that came or generated from the US sites versus uh, outside US, of course, we'll be uh, doing an inspection outside US, um, as well as um, uh, scientific uh, misconduct uh, based on complaint, based on information that we get. If they indicate uh, that the foreign sites may um, have been involved within that kind of scenario, we do uh, send uh, our inspectors to conduct inspection. And um, the, the second question you asked me was about the types of uh, findings uh, between US and the US um, sites. In general, they, they, are, uh, they are very much similar. And um, often uh, the most common, I think, during the talk, um, Anne or uh, Stephanie may have, I, I think Stephanie raised about that. And um, often we see uh, investigators uh, failing to follow uh, the investigation plan and the protocol. That's the most common um, finding or the type of inspection, inspection of findings we come across. And um, keeping uh, the, the accurate records is another challenge uh, that sometimes we come across. And um, um, the inadequate drug accountability, as you all know by now, um, our citations are based on our regulatory requirements. And um, I mean, generally, I mean, failure to follow the investigation plan and the protocol and, uh, and uh, maintaining the accurate uh, study records and as well as um, uh, adequate uh, drug accountability are the most common causes that of inspectional findings, the most common inspectional findings we identify both in the US and outside US. Thank you. Great, thank you, Casa. Uh, continuing on the theme of inspections, uh, Stephanie, a couple of questions for you. The first is, in addition to the clinical investigator inspection, would FDA perform a GCP inspection at the CRO, Clinical Research Organization, and or the sponsor sites during the BLA NDA pre-market application review? Hi, thank you for that question. Yes, um, although the topic of, of this session was clinical investigators, yes, we do inspect uh, contract research organizations and the sponsor uh, for marketing application review. Great, thanks. And one additional question there. Uh, what guidance are you able to provide a sponsor who may want to request a site inspection? How often does this happen and what types of concerns would prompt a sponsor to request an inspection? Hi, uh, thanks for that interesting question. Uh, sponsors don't necessarily request FDA outright to perform site inspections. You know, sponsors can perform monitoring visits and audits. Uh, uh, or, or obtain audits, uh, but what they can do is inform FDA of issues with their particular site, uh, and that can trigger an, an inspection with the FDA. And so uh, sponsors can let FDA know via uh, an email box for uh, good clinical practice issues um, through the IND submission. 
application, or um, if, if there's a marketing application, they can include uh, issues with particular sites uh, in the clinical study report or in other sections in the uh, marketing application. And so th those are methods that uh, FDA can become aware of issues with, uh, with a particular site. And some issues that you know we look seriously at are, are things are like sites being terminated for issues with subject safety, uh, lack of uh, clinical uh, investigator oversight or uh, data integrity or, or, or fraud. Thank you. And Anne, uh, we have a couple of questions for you related to informed consent, which you also covered during your talk. Uh, the first is, does the pre-screening process also need to be conducted after the informed consent form is signed? Pre-screening and screening procedures to determine trial eligibility. Uh, is signing required? So that's a, a good question. And it's a topic that we have um, a, a, a guidance on screening tests prior to study enrollment. And you know that guidance highlights that procedures that are um, you know, any clinical screening procedures that are performed solely for the purpose of determining eligibility for research, you need to obtain informed consent prior to initiating those procedures. Um, these are these clinical screening procedures that are for research eligibility are considered part of the subject selection and recruitment process. Um, and therefore require consent, require IRB oversight. So, so thanks for that question. Great, thanks. And another informed consent question. Can informed consent be provided by a family member if a trial therapeutic is indicated for trauma victims who frequently will present to the emergency department unconscious? So another, another good question and, and one that gets to the, the concept of a legally authorized representative and who can serve as a legally authorized representative and what their role is. So our regulations define a legally authorized representative or LAR as an individual or a judicial or other body authorized under applicable law to consent on behalf of a prospective subject to the subject's participation in the procedures involved in the research. So the, the key point here when thinking about who can consent on behalf of the subject as a legally authorized representative is that they have to be authorized under applicable law to consent on behalf of a prospective uh, participant. Um, so once identified, that legally authorized representative may sign the consent form for the prospective participant should that individual not be capable of providing their own informed consent. And they also um, should be consulted to make decisions on behalf of the subject and to assure that any such decisions are in the subject's best interest while the, the participant is um, enrolled and, and continues within the study. Um, you know, so I, I think that is, uh, uh, hopefully that gets to the question. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Anne. CASA, another record keeping question. Ma many developing countries do not have the same record keeping and data collection requirements as the United States. What precautions should US sponsors or CROs use when conducting clinical trials internationally? Wow, uh, that, that's a great question. And um, yeah, that, that happened presently. I, I think it's sponsored in CRO. We need to, I, earlier uh, Anne was talking about quality by design. We need to look into several factors before um, considering conducting a study um, outside, outside the country where uh, they want to submit marketing application. And as uh, you all know, and during presentation also, I mentioned about applicability of um, the, 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 the population and the medical practice and um, the standard that may exist in uh, certain countries need to be taken into account. Uh, of course, and the sponsors are uh, expected to uh, ensure that, that, that the clinical study they're planning to conduct and the clinical investigators um, 
um, have the, the appropriate resources to, uh, to, to, to meet the regulatory expectation. Therefore, I think it's very important to uh, have um, a discussion with, with, with sponsors and CROs uh, before one um, uh, join to, to, to conduct clinical investigator uh, as a clinical investigator um, a clinical trial. And, uh, and it is a very difficult subject, but the, the sponsor should uh, provide resources that would be necessary to conduct uh, the clinical study and uh, to ensure the data are reliable and appropriate for regulatory audit and uh, that the patients are safe and their rights and their safety and well-being are protected and um, and also to comply with the regulatory expectation whether the u.s regulatory expectation or outside um, i think my advice to clinical investigators or to people who want to uh, become clinical investigators it's very important uh, to assess uh, the environment and work with the uh, the sponsors to obtain the necessary resources to maintain um, records and i i do feel i think the technology the technological advancement uh, would would um, help um, uh, countries like a, a third part of the world uh, perhaps the cloud um, uh, sources could could also support in maintaining some of the records that may be needed in clinical trials and uh, the bottom line they need it depends and they need to discuss with the sponsor kim Great, thank you, Casa. Uh, and a more general question, uh, what are the major mistakes to avoid when conducting clinical trials internationally? Yeah, the, the, for the sponsors um, uh, I mentioned, and um, again, the acceptance of data by the US uh, FDA uh, depends um, the, um, uh, if the data um, is applicable to, to the U.S. population and also the medical practice here in the U.S. Therefore, it is very important the sponsors determine that's the case. And um, of course, earlier we were talking about GCP. Um, uh, both Anne and Stephanie touched upon uh, GCP, and they need to make sure that they have investigators, that they have um, uh, the recognition or competence to, to conduct clinical studies. And, um, and also they need to make sure that um, regulators such as FDA would be able uh, to audit the data when um, that uh, deems necessary. Therefore, I, I think the homework is uh, first making sure um, the clinical standard is applicable to the US and since we are talking about US FDA or to any other um, regulatory agency. Um, those are the things. and. Uh, uh, really, sponsors need to make sure that um, uh, that the, the, the data that would be generated from foreign countries would support uh, the, their marketing application in the future, um, taking into account the clinical standards. That's what I would say, uh, Kim. Thanks, Casa. And Anne, we'll, we'll shift gears slightly to you. Uh, there's a couple of questions here about other types of requirements. So what trials are required to be registered in the clinicaltrials.gov databank? Wow, that's, that's such a good question and, and one where um, I think if we think about clinicaltrials.gov and trials transparency, where the agency is really committed to promoting transparency and will continue to uh, advance our compliance activities related to the clinicaltrials.gov database. So the, the requirements um, apply, the trials that are acquired, that, that are subject to the requirements are applicable clinical trials. And the uh, section 801 of the of FDA, including its implementing regulations at 42 CFR part 11, or the other part 11, <laughs> as referenced in uh, my presentation, specifies requirements for um, submitting registration and results information for these applicable clinical trials. So an applicable to clinical trial generally meets all of the following uh, criteria. It's interventional, it's evaluating at least one drug, biological, or device product or combination thereof regulated by FDA. It's other than a phase one trial of a drug or biological product, or is other than a, a small clinical trial to determine the feasibility of a device. 
Um, and it also has to meet one of the following criteria. At least one study facility is located in the U.S. or a U.S. territory, or it's conducted under an IND or IDE, or it involves a drug, biologic, or device product that's manufactured in and exported from the U.S. Uh, or a U.S. territory for study in another country. So I think it, it's that's the the kind of definition of an applicable clinical trial, um, and those who have to uh, register those applicable clinical trials and report uh, summary results when required are known as the responsible party. And under clinicaltrials.gov, this is uh, under the regulations, this is the sponsor of the trial unless and until a principal investigator has been designated as the responsible party. So if, if a study is conducted under an IND or under an IDE, the IND or IDE sponsor is generally re the responsible party. If an applicable clinical trial is not conducted under an IND or IDE, it, the responsible party would be the single person or entity who initiates the trial and has um, authority and control over the trial. So again, really excellent question. Thank you for asking. Yeah, great. A lot to unpack there. Uh, another question on requirements. Is a written delegation of authority log a requirement? It is another good question. So our regulations are silent on the delegation of authority log. Where you will see delegation of authority logs referenced are, is in guidance. So, um, for example, um, in the ICH E6 R3 uh, draft guideline in section 2.3.3, the statement that the investigator should ensure a record is maintained of the persons and parties to whom the investigator has delegated significant trial-related activities. You'll also see that uh, referenced in guidance, um, FDA's own guidance on investigator responsibilities, but it is not um, a requirement um, in, that's uh, within our, our regulations. Thanks. Thank you. And one more for you while I have you. On slide seven, you said, quote, transfer responsibility, which does not align with my understanding. GCP is clear that responsibility remains with the sponsor. Do you mean transfer of work activities? So that's a good question. So I, I, I was referencing our regulations, um, our IND regulations under subpart D, the responsibilities of sponsors, investigators, actually talks about in uh, 312.52, the transfer of obligations uh, from a sponsor to a contract research organization. So a sponsor may transfer responsibility for any of all or all of the obligations set forth in this part to a contract research organization. So um, those things need to be transferred in writing. I think what the questioner is referencing is that you can transfer responsibility for an obligation, but at the end of the day, a sponsor is accountable for the overall quality of the trial and for the information submitted to the agency. So you still need to have uh, appropriate oversight of um, the, the responsibilities that you've transferred. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify. That's great, great questions. Uh, Stephanie, a couple uh, clarifications on terminology from your talk. Uh, the first is what specific certification does, quote, laboratory certification refer to? Please provide examples. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Um, so uh, the certification I was referring to is, a, you know, a certification from an organization that certifies the lab is able to do its job, receive human samples for testing. Um, and uh, on, on that end. Um, so a common certification in the US is the CLIA certificate, Clinical Laboratory Improvements Amendment Certificate. Um, labs have to be certified uh, with CLIA so that they can uh, receive payments from Medicare or Medicaid. So that's a common one in the US. Great, thank you. And then another uh, terminology question. One of your slides referenced, quote, data flow. What is that referring to? Hi, yeah, th thank you again for that question. Um, so I was referring to how the data that you generate at your site 
gets gets transmitted to to the sponsor. Um, so you know you're recording the data initially. It might be on paper. It might be electronically. And you know how does that get to the sponsor um, intact? Or you know are, are there any um, issues with data integrity or security? So if it was on paper that you originally recorded information, like on a study worksheet or something, you know how was that transferred to the sponsor? Did uh, a research coordinator enter it into an electronic database? And you know were password protections in place that only specific people could could do that? Um, and were there any issues with alteration and things like that? Um, sometimes assessments are made electronically through tablets or um, other devices, and so um, and then it, and then it's you know transmitted automatically to the sponsor. So things we might look at there are things like audit trails, um, kind of to see who entered the data, um, that specific people were entering the data, and that you know logins and passwords weren't weren't being shared. And then when again when it was transmitted to the sponsor. So basically how everything went from you all um, and, and into the into the company. Great, thank you. And then a, a more general question, uh, is interest in understanding how likely it is to have a site visit and inspection? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, things that we look at for a site inspection, um, in particular for those related to a marketing application, uh, we look at, you know, the size of, of the site it itself, um, how many um, subjects were enrolled, um, how how well your site contributed to total study efficacy. Um, was it a was it a outstanding uh, you know trial trial site? And so was a big contributor to study efficacy. Um, was your study site an out, outlier for adverse events? And and it might not just be that you had a lot of adverse events and protocol deviations. That could just be you doing a great job in terms of reporting those. It might be that it, it looks funny that you didn't have any adverse events or, or protocol deviations. And so we might uh, wanna look at those. Um, if, if you've had a previous inspection history that uh, you know we might wanna to touch on some of the things that were, were found at that previous inspection history, uh, we might be considering going back. Um, and as I kind of touched on in a previous uh, response, you know, the sponsor, as part of the, the submission, um, informs us of any issues at particular sites. And so if there was any uh, concerns by the sponsor about data integrity, subject safety, um, and, and those sorts of things, uh, you know, those are some things that we might look at for uh, choosing your site. We have a specific tool that helps us. So it's not kind of willy nilly. It's not a, not a lottery. It's, it's uh, we, we take all those uh, factors into consideration. Great, thank you. Casa, uh, Anne got some questions earlier about the Form 1572, and, and we have a question uh, from more of an international perspective. Uh, the question is, as far as I know, investigators in the European Union are not allowed to sign Form 1572. What should a U.S. sponsor do when conducting a trial in the European Union for a product under IND? Um, uh, yeah, then I mean, not the entire European Union, and uh, so the, in European Union, some countries have uh, uh, local regulatory requirement that asks um, uh, their clinical investigators not to sign 1572. I think I uh, addressed that, and uh, there is a mechanism for that. If the um, clinical investigator had signed uh, an IND or went to sign an IND, uh, that would be considered. I mean, um, people, clinical investigators may be able to conduct a study under IND after having uh, the waiver um, requirement made, and they can ask uh, to conduct the study under IND and um, and get the waiver. And uh, but um, during my talk, also I mentioned uh, outside US. Uh, clinical trials in support of marketing application can be conducted under IND, or there is no requirement to conduct clinical study under uh, under IND, and uh, they they can be conducted outside IND. And um, however, if clinical trial is conducted under an IND, um, the requirement is that people have just discussed 
must be made. Um, and during inspection, our inspectors uh, take into account uh, so some of uh, the regulatory, the local regu uh, regulatory requirement that the clinical investigators have to meet. Uh, therefore, if there is like a requirement, let's say uh, Germany um, may, may uh, uh, ask the clinical investigators not to sign 1572, we do take that into account. We, we recognize and we do say also they need to meet the, uh, in ICH. Those uh, is six R three, and uh, before um, local regulatory requirement meeting re local regulatory requirement is one criteria. Therefore, um, uh, the, the clinical investigator should be proactive and uh, take this into account. And um, if there is um, a difficulty to sign 1572 because of local regulatory requirement, they need to work with with their uh, sponsor to have um, the waiver recognition. Uh, or they, they should conduct the study outside Andy, uh, Kim. Great, thank you, Kasa. Anne, uh, are there any guidance documents specifically for risk-based auditing, auditing risk-based monitoring? Oh, I love this topic. Um, <laughs> there, because, you know, I'm, I really um, am an advocate for risk proportionate approaches to oversight. We actually have um, quite a few guidance documents that touch on uh, risk-based monitoring or risk-based quality management. So from, uh, you know, the specific to risk-based monitoring, there is uh, a guidance, on, a final guidance on oversight of clinical investigations, a risk-based approach to monitoring that came out in 2013. There is a more recent um, 2019 guidance uh, that on risk-based uh, risk approach to monitoring of clinical investigations. That is a um, Q&A uh, document. And then, of course, there is the um, ICH E6 uh, R3 uh, that you know, discusses uh, risk-based uh, risk approaches um, and kind of risk proportionality in terms of, of oversight. So, you know, I think there is, you know, if you're interested, the FDA does have a website that we have all of our clinical trials related guidance documents um, that if you just search for uh, clinical trials guidance FDA, you should be able to find it pretty quickly. Um, it, because it's a very useful resource where you can kind of filter down to guidances on the specific topic that might be of interest to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Anne. And uh, Casa, a follow-up question for you that's related to, to Anne's question. Uh, from an inspection perspective, uh, what are the key aspects you would look for when reviewing uh, risk-based quality approaches? Thank you, Kim, and uh, that's a great question as well. And um, really, the, the, the risk-based approach, the, the first, first of all, it, it's a dynamic process, and it starts, and uh, it needs to occur throughout the life span of the, the, the drug development. And uh, and uh, therefore, we would like to see uh, the pre-specification and uh, the way how uh, people have determined what are important, what are critical. Uh, for, from uh, data reliability perspective, from process perspective, impacting um, the reliability of data uh, from patient safety perspective. Or, and um, uh, based on the pre-specified criteria, have people followed? Really, the key is, I think Anne pointed out, uh, what we care during an inspection is to make sure that uh, the um, things that matter most have been uh, properly um, overseen. and. Uh, uh, those are the things that we see in, 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 in uh, connection with our regulatory requirement. And perhaps, I mean, as uh, most people here um, have uh, seen, our inspector focus, for example, on uh, informed consent, the ethical development of the product. Has that happened throughout the lifespan of the drug development? And we would care about primary endpoints that, that, that are critical for labeling of a product and um, also to claim, uh, to make a claim about the product uh, efficacy. And um, of course, the regulatory um, expectations would be seen. But the bottom line is um, how were those risks identified and um, how people followed the appropriate steps once those risks 
um, had been identified during the study. Those kind of things are um, what we care about during the inspection, Kim. Thank you. And, and as an uh, inspection related question for Stephanie this time, uh, when sponsors, not CROs, undergo inspections, what aspects are most crucial for inspection? Hi, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, just like for clinical investigators, um, clinical inspections and what we look for are, are really tied um, to our, uh, the entity's regulatory responsibilities. So I, I know Anne gave a really nice presentation on the regulatory responsibilities for clinical investigators. Um, sponsors themselves have uh, uh, their own regulatory responsibilities. And so um, the inspection is is focused on that aspect. And so um, some things we look at are the um, how they selected and uh, trained and kind of monitored the clinical investigators and the actions at the clinical sites. You know, if there were issues at the clinical sites, you know, what corrective actions did they take? And if they weren't corrected, were, the, were sites terminated? So kind of their overall um, oversight of clinical investigators. Um, likewise, their oversight and management of contract research organizations and third-party vendors. Uh, we look at that, um, how they um, chose their study monitors, their monitoring procedures and activities, um, and kind of taking the, I talked about data flow from the site to the sponsor level, you know, what was the data flow from you know, from the sponsor to, to FDA, what kind of uh, manipulations to the data that they did, um, their responsibilities for adverse event reporting. Uh, we look at that and, um, you know, their record retention and things like that. So um, it's really tied uh, to uh, their regulatory responsibilities and um, anything of particular interest to the particular studies we're looking at or uh, what the review division is also interested in, in focusing on. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, Stephanie. Uh, does FDA inspect against clinical investigator, sponsor, or CRO standard operating procedures? Hi, great question. Yeah, we, we you know, uh, my talk focused mainly on protocol compliance and kind of the, using the protocol as kind of the uh, the, the guidebook of what we're looking for in inspections, uh, but we do look at standard operating procedures um, that the site might have, that the contract research organization may have, and the sponsor may have. It, it kind of just um, helps round out our, our picture of how the study was conducted, how it was managed and reported. Um, so it gives us good ideas of, um, you know, why data was recorded in a certain way, why it was reported in a certain way in, a, in the study report, why certain things weren't reported to FDA, it, it kind of gives us a, a you know a global picture of uh, the study conduct beyond the protocol and study documents. Thank you. Uh, and another one for you, sorry to keep you on the hot seat for so long, but clearly a lot of interest in this topic area. Uh, how long should uh, a site store the clinical study samples at facility and also investigational products? I'm not sure that's worded quite right, but hopefully you know what they're getting at. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the earlier questions had talked about study records. So yeah, you're, you're probably wondering what to do with all the other things at your site. Um, so if, you know, in terms of uh, you know, an investigational product or samples, um, usually some of that, some of that of what to do, um, uh, because you are responsible for that as part of your regulatory responsibilities, is that that might be outlined in the protocol or a pharmacy manual, manual about how to dispose them or send them back to the sponsor. Um, so um, definitely look in those areas of the protocol or manual. Um, and otherwise, I, I would recommend just checking uh, with the sponsor or your study monitor um, who might be more accessible. Great, thank you. And last one for you for the for this part, I promise. Uh, does inspectional approach defined in CPE 7348.811 apply to a sponsor or there is there an alternate CP the FDA applies? Yeah, great question. And, and thanks to the person who is really paying attention to that uh, compliance manual. Yes, there's a different uh, compliance manual uh, for sponsors and contract research organizations. 
And actually, it also includes uh, sponsored investigators. So it might apply to some of those of you out there. Um, and so that number is uh, the same number, just with uh, with the zero at the end. So um, 7348.810. And, and that's also found on the website as well. Um, some of the things I talked about and related to an earlier question about you know, what things we look for at a sponsor inspection are included in that manual. So I kind of summarized a little bit about what you might see if you actually went, went to that and looked at the manual. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the uh, One more question for you, Anne. Uh, you had addressed the informed consent uh, process earlier and answered some questions related to informed consent. Uh, this one is about the ascent process. Can you please speak to the ascent process for pediatric subjects? Sure, I would be happy to. So um, our regulations at um, 21 CFR Part 50, Subpart D, provide additional safeguards for children enrolled in clinical investigations. So if, if a child is going to be enrolled in, in a trial, parental or guardian permission must be obtained um, and documented. And when appropriate, uh, the child's assent must also be obtained. Um, so this is something, uh, assent essentially means a child's affirmative agreement to take part in a clinical investigation, not just that they failed to object. So child's assent when, uh, when appropriate, and that's something the IRB uh, needs to consider, and parental or guardian permission taken together really meet the ethical requirement to obtain informed consent. And I think for those who are interested in ethical aspects of pediatric clinical investigations, um, my colleagues uh, in the uh, Office of Pediatric Therapeutics published a draft guidance in September of 2022 on um, ethical considerations for clinical investigations of, uh, of medical products involving children that I think is an excellent read. I would also direct you, um, which I don't think I mentioned earlier, that just a few months ago, we uh, published a final uh, informed consent guidance that um, updates an, uh, an older draft guidance and has a really a, a wealth of information, both um, with just general information about uh, the different aspects of our um, consent regulations, um, uh, all the way through a, a series of, of uh, questions and answers about various scenarios. So there's a, a lot of resources uh, available for those who, who have questions uh, about informed consent. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions here about global studies, uh, not directed to an individual, but I assume, Casa, that this is for you. Uh, in a global study, is it okay if different country sites used different instruments or platforms for data production or analysis as long as they have validated methods? Uh, thank you, Kim. Yes, and uh, it would be okay. It is very important to have um, a discussion with with the sponsor, and um, and I, I think we may be talking about a sponsor or a CRO responsibility, and uh, this is just like having uh, paper uh, based uh, source records versus uh, using an electronic platform. Both are fine, and um, uh, the the question is, would those instruments or tools? Um, uh, would be uh, fit for purpose uh, to generate and to capture the information. That needs to be taken into account. Uh, but in terms of generating the data, um, I think the part 11 is one of uh, the, the things that was mentioned here. Uh, people need to take into account if they use electronic uh, kind of records, uh, they need to uh, meet that expectation. Uh, but using a different platform is uh, absolutely fine. Um, if the tools are uh, properly validated and um, and uh, if they are compliant with the expectations. Kim? Thank you, Casa. And one more for you. Uh, in the efforts to diversify participation in clinical trials, what are the sponsor's responsibilities in conducting trials, for example, in, in Africa or South America? Um, 
Uh, this is a great question, actually. Uh, it would be that, I mean, first and foremost, it would be um, in the interest of the sponsor uh, to diversify um, uh, the patients uh, because um, the study data would be applicable across the globe if they, they have diversity. Uh, from, Of course, from patient perspective and public health perspective, it would have also a huge value. And um, there are various things that may have been mentioned uh, during uh, discussion yesterday. Um, the different kind of approach, and, uh, including a dis decentralized feature and uh, considering real world data and, uh, and uh, the, the, the trying to, to make uh, the studies like patient centric through the decentralized feature. All this uh, could enable uh, diversifying uh, the patient population that would participate in clinical trials that would have not been um, able to participate. And um, uh, since regions have been mentioned, uh, it is very critical uh, to, 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 for the sponsors to include patients across the globe, uh, taking into account uh, the, um, what the product is, uh, is going to be developed for. And um, uh, therefore the sponsor responsibility is really um, identifying the benefit of um, uh, diversity and uh, also implementing that, that that to happen. And there may be instances where sponsors may not be able to diversify. Uh, let's say uh, there is a, a tropical uh, illness that may not occur in some other countries. And uh, those things are very straightforward, but diverse, diversifying patient population or study participants uh, is very critical, both for a sponsor as well as for public health. Kim? Absolutely, and, and a lot of work uh, ongoing in that area currently to, to try to make sure our trials represent uh, the patients who are out there using these products. So, so on that note, um, I would like to thank all of the presenters for both excellent presentations and for fielding a, a large number of, of really good questions during the question and answer period, and also thank the audience for, for putting these questions uh, into the chat to allow us to have uh, additional discussions of, of these issues. Uh, and with that, I would just like to, to wrap up this session and, and hand it over to Leonard for some closing remarks on the course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kim. And uh, thanks very much to the presenters, to Anne, Stephanie, and to Casa. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of Year's course. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground uh, with regard to clini uh, clinical trials, uh, the clinical, the scientific, and the regulatory aspects that are important. And we very much hope that this has been helpful to you as you go ahead with a very important contribution you're making to the health of society. Obviously, it's not possible to cover all aspects of clinical trials, and we would welcome your feedback to help us as we prepare for the course next year. Uh, it remains for me to thank all my colleagues involved in the course. It's been a big production. A particular vote of thanks to Brenda Stoddart and SBIA for basically supporting the course. Uh, to Ray Ford for all his help in keeping us on track with housekeeping. To Jeff Kelly for his excellent and competent handling of uh, the webinar and dealing with all the storms that happened behind the scenes in such a competent and quiet way. Uh, thanks to Millie Double from my office for all the help with the administration and organization, and to Kim Smith, uh, who's been a great co-moderator and has helped us significantly with developing the context of the content of the course. Uh, I want to thank all speakers, and finally, a particular vote of thanks to our audience from all over the world for your dynamic participation. So from us at FDA, our sincere thanks to you all for taking part in the course.